Good afternoon, everyone. We will shortly start the program in a few minutes. Recording in progress. You're on mute, sir. Are we all ready to start? Yes. 
Yes, yes we are ready. Good afternoon from Timor Leste. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We are very glad to join you this, in this dialogue, regional dialogue. Hello and uh, greetings from uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, I know we have um, an audience from across the world. Um, and so I think it's safer to say greetings, uh, excellencies, and all distinguished participants. Uh, my name is uh, Sabra Hussain Taudri. I'm a member of parliament from Bangladesh. Uh, Dhaka 9 is my constituency. And uh, I'm also president uh, uh, emeritus of the Inter-Parliamentary Union, having served as the 28th president from 2014 till 2017. Uh, let me extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the Asia Regional Dialogue 2021. This dialogue is co-hosted by the government of Bangladesh as the current chair of the CBF and the Philippines as a former chair. Uh, and as we all know well, these are countries that are amongst the most vulnerable and also at the forefront of climate action, pushing the agenda forward with their tireless and sincere efforts. The Climate Vulnerable Forum, CBF as we all know it by, Asia Dialogue is the fourth and final in a series of CBF regional dialogues convened by the forum to identify an up-to-date real-time understanding of the various challenges, successes, needs, and gaps that the region's most vulnerable developing nations face as they work tirelessly to implement climate change policies and address the growing global challenge of climate change. The dialogue provided a forum for CBF member and observer countries in the region to share climate change policy experiences and develop shared priorities. Its findings will inform the CBF's global deliberations ahead of key multilateral global policy events this year, such as the UNFCCC COP26 that is going to be held in Glasgow shortly, and also help to build global momentum for the shared agenda of climate vulnerable countries throughout 2021. On the 27th and 28th, the meeting of experts began with the process of finalizing a CBF regional communique, outlining regional perspectives on climate action, as well as discussions on the CBF UNFCCC COP26 policy priorities on important areas, I would say critical areas, such as loss and damage, the 1.5 degrees Celsius ambition, finance and adaptation, carbon markets, and of course, partnership for climate prosperity to build momentum and awareness around the CBF's agenda in the region. We also heard from CBF key partners and collaborators, the UNITAR Climate Change Diplomacy Training Learning Session was a success with participants going through the UNFCCC climate change negotiation process, including the Paris Agreement and nationally determined contributions, as well as challenges and opportunities on the road to COP26 with a clear focus on transparency. The opening remarks, a video presented by the CBF Secretariat and a keynote statement from the COP26 presidency are all part of today's ministerial segment. Following that, Ms. Paolo Alvarez, Assistant Secretary, Department of Finance, Republic of the Philippines, presented a reporting session. The roundtable will then be moderated by Honorable Secretary of Finance, Carlos Dominguez III, with a closing remark from Honorable Abul Kalam Azad, Special Envoy of Bangladesh's Presidency of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. I thank you all for your participation today, and we are really looking forward to the deliberations that are going to follow. I would now like to invite His Excellency Carlos G. Dominguez III, Finance Secretary and Chair Designate of the very important Climate Change Commission of the Philippines. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. His Excellency Mohammed Nasheed, former president of the Republic of the Maldives and current speaker 
of the People's Majlis, Honorable Lauren Legarda, Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives of the Republic of the Philippines, Honorable Robert Dixon, British High Commissioner in Bangladesh, distinguished guests, good afternoon. I would like to thank our co-host country, Bangladesh, for this valuable opportunity to address this forum. This discussion among the most vulnerable countries underscores the inseparability of our efforts to mitigate global warming and our demand for climate justice. Developing nations facing the most severe consequences of global warming bear little responsibility for the pollution caused by industrialization. The Philippines is an example of this. The country contributes only about three tenths of 1% to global greenhouse gas emissions. But as an archipelago sitting on the typhoon belt and the Pacific ring of fire, we are most exposed to adverse effects of climate change. The Philippines ranked ninth out of 181 nations in the world as the most affected country for, from extreme weather events in the 2020 World Risk Index. The Global Climate Risk Index 2021, meanwhile, ranked the Philippines fourth among 10 countries most severely hit by extreme weather events from 2000 to 2019. These rankings obviously do not bring us any comfort. Taking into account our own vulnerabilities in the face of global warming, the Philippines submitted an ambitious nationally determined contribution. We committed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 75% over the next decade. This ambitious goal will require comprehensive policy changes and a whole of nation approach. To achieve our bold target, we are pushing for the congressional passage of a bill that will ban single use plastics. Once passed, every Filipino will have the ability to do his or her part on a daily basis in helping save the world's environment. We are also exploring a financing mechanism to enable the government to improve the generating capacity of a hydropower plant in Mindanao and acquire coal-fired power plants in the region to repurpose them. This will shift most of our energy requirements in Mindanao to hydropower. Eventually, it will spur investments from companies seeking to expand their operations in areas powered by clean energy. Our farmers face the increasing likelihood of suffering losses due to severe and erratic weather events caused by climate change. With this, we are expanding the assets and crops that the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation covers. Our ultimate goal is to transform this agency into a viable instrument that will provide our farmers adequate protection from crop losses while reinforcing our risk mitigation and resilience efforts. The Paris Agreement provides us a framework for the countries of the world to work together to reverse global warming. An important part of this framework involves the wealthier countries extending financial support to developing nations to assist in mitigation programs and the transition to greener economies. We have all submitted our nationally determined goals to the global effort. We must now demand the wealthier countries to raise the financing to support the achievement of these goals. Those countries that contribute the most 
to greenhouse ga gas emissions must bear the greater burden for mitigating the planet's warming. Among the most vulnerable to the consequences of climate change should receive the most urgent support. These are the essential components of climate justice. We also need to work together to come up with new financial frameworks in order to build a global insurance safety net. We should be able to devise a toolkit of innovative, responsive, affordable, and accessible financial solutions to mitigate the adverse effects of climate events on vulnerable nations. The toolkit should be able to assist developing countries through financing arrangements, investments, and technology transfer. This climate vulnerable forum consisting of countries most threatened by the ill effects of global warming has the golden opportunity to serve as a world leader in this fight against climate change. Let us lead the charge now and show the rest of the global community how simultaneous and concerted actions can make a lasting impact in saving the only planet we have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Excellency, uh, very much for those very insight, uh, insightful remarks. And I think you've really set the scene. You've covered a lot of ground uh, in a very short time. And of course, we know that Philippines has been an outstanding champion, not only when it comes to legislation, but also taking practical action. And of course, it was uh, during the chairmanship of the Philippines that uh, prior to the Paris Agreement, uh, the CBF launched a very successful campaign of uh, the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, as being an, an overarching ambition. Uh, thank you for those uh, opening remarks. Um, I would now like to uh, move on and uh, invite His Excellency Mr. A.K. Abdul Momen, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, People's Republic of Bangladesh. Uh, you have the floor, Honorable Prime Minister. Bismillah rahman rahim His Excellency, Mr. Carlos Domingos, Finance Secretary of the Republic of the Philippines and co-host of this regional dialogue, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this ministerial meeting of the CBF, Asia Regional Dialogue, along with His Excellency Carlos Domingos, Finance Secretary of the Republic of the Philippines. Excellencies, we are happy to co-host the fourth and the last round of the CBF Regional Dialogue after the completion of the three consecutive dialogues for the regions of Latin America and the Caribbean, Africa and the Middle East and the Pacific. The number and frequency of natural disasters are rising in every corner of the globe. And in the Asian region is, uh, is no exception. Threats of climate change and human-induced disasters have brought havoc for many countries in this part of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we are hopeful about reaching an ambitious and just outcome at the upcoming COP26 in Glasgow. As the current chair of the CBF, Bangladesh priority is to raise the voices and protect the interest of the 48 climate vulnerable countries of the forum that ranges from Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, Latin America, and the Pacific. CBS Manifesto for COP26 calls on the international community to seize the unique opportunity in Glasgow to deliver, as it may be the last chance for humanity to avert climate catastrophe and protect the most vulnerable, and also to protect this planet Earth. In CBF Manifesto, we elaborated a climate emergency pact where we proposed formulating 
a delivery plan of $500 billion in climate financing for the developing countries with a 50-50 ratio between adaptation and mitigation. Secondly, we will urge all governments, especially the significant <coughs> emitters, to develop more ambitious measures on adaptation and mitigation over their current NDCs. This manifesto also calls for meaningful progress of loss and damage, including fully organizational, uh, this operationalizing the Santiago network on loss and damage, realizing the commitments under Warsaw international mechanisms and mandating work for financing options to increase support to the frontline community. Distinguished guest, as the chair of CBF, Bangladesh is continuously advocating for getting more financial resources for the forum members. We recently hosted the first Climate Vulnerable Finance Summit and the seventh P20 Ministerial Dialogue Roundtable in that spirit. Under the visionary leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, Bangladesh is pursuing key initiatives like forming new parliamentary forum of the CBF, launching the CBF and B20 joint multi-donor fund, and so on. We are further strengthening our commitment to global goals at the national front by implementing a state-of-the-art Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan to achieve low-carbon economic growth for optimized prosperity and partnership to ensure environmental protection for sustained economic growth, Bangladesh has formulated Bangladesh Delta Plan 2100. Dear colleagues, let me share some concluding thoughts before you. First, major emitters must commit to limit the global temperature at 1.5 degrees centigrade. We must work together to secure that target. Second, Developed economies must come forward with enhanced financial resources for the climate vulnerable countries which should be predictable, accessible and balanced at 50-50 ratio between adaptation and mitigation. Third, we must continue our efforts to get advanced technological support through North-South, South-South and triangular cooperation for the developing countries. And fourth, rehabilitation of people who have lost their homes and traditional jobs due to impacts of climate change, including sea level rise, increasing salinity, river erosion, floods and droughts must be a global shared responsibility. And finally, addressing loss and damage with financial as well as technical support from the advanced economies which should be in addition to the climate finance for mitigation and adaptation measures. Let me conclude by expressing special gratitude to the Philippines for joining Bangladesh in co-hosting this meaningful regional dialogue. Also, I would like to convey my heartfelt thanks to the GCA Secretariat and the expert advisory group for their continued support. I thank you all. Joy Bangla, Joy Bonga Bondu. Thank you uh, so very much, uh, Your Excellency Foreign Minister uh, at the moment uh, for your uh, inspiring words. Bangladesh has indeed been an outstanding champion when it comes to responding to the adverse impacts of climate change. And you mentioned the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan. I think it's, uh, it's going to be a world first in terms of how a developing country is transitioning from adaptation and building resilience and then moving on to prosperity. I think that's uh, going to be an inspiring trajectory for many developing countries and developed countries, if I may say so, alike. Uh, thank you once again for your comments. Uh, I would now like to invite um, someone that I've known for, uh, for many, many years, um, His Excellency Mohammed Nasheed. Uh, probably more well known as a former president of the Maldives, but currently he has an equally important responsibility as Speaker of the House uh, much uh, in the Maldives, and he's also the CBF uh, thematic ambassador for ambition. 
something that we could all do uh, with. And uh, I'm now going to request him to provide his opening remarks. You have the floor, Your Excellency. Thank you, Your Excellency. Do we have His uh, Excellency Mohammed Nasheed on the line? Okay, maybe uh, it's a technical issue. Um, Lorraine uh, Lagarda, the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives of the Philippines and CVA thematic ambassador for parliaments. Um, if you are on the line, would you like to come in and then I can go back to uh, Speaker Nasheed. friends and colleagues of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. The reports of the past months tell us that we may not be doing enough to save our planet and our future. Global warming might breach past the 1.5 degree survival threshold by 2040, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Our NDCs lead to a 2.7 degrees world, according to the United Nations. July this year was also said to be the hottest month ever recorded, with 2021 most likely to be among the hottest years on record. It will be the apathy and the inaction of those most able and responsible that will lead us to ruin, but it will also be our inability to influence leaders and the rest of the world that will undermine our future. Let us not forget that it is the CVF that successfully fought for the 1.5 degrees Celsius. Not feasible or too ideal, they said at the time, but it is the 1.5 that's deemed the most advantageous and the best climate pathway by the global scientific community, now with tremendous support from climate advocates around the world. Mm. In this ministerial meeting, we have to believe in our voice, in our mm. leadership, to drive up climate ambition and action. Mm. As COP26 draws near, we have to be clear and firm about our priorities. We need to set expectations and demand accountability. And just like what we did for the 1.5, we need to fight tooth and nail for all of them. We have to make up for lost time and promises. The whole world, most especially our youth, are looking up to us for answers and the assurance that everything will actually be better. These are the most crucial moments in our climate movement and we have to be better and stronger, united in our call for the 1.5. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Moran, and also for the leadership that you provide, uh, the inspiration that you provide. And of course, we are all very uh, much looking forward to the official launch of the CDF parliamentary group uh, and I think we will then have really a much more uh, structured uh, approach as parliamentarians uh, in assisting our governments to respond to what we all think is an existential crisis. And, uh, and I look forward to working with you also in that regard. Um, may I just go back to uh, President, uh, or rather Speaker Nasheed, if, uh, if he's there. Otherwise, uh, I will move on. No? Okay, we'll st uh, still keep trying. You know, technology does have a way um, to, uh, to say that they are still in charge and, and we are not. Um, so we will continue our efforts and uh, maybe we will have the pleasure and the privilege of uh, hearing him a little bit later. I know we always uh, look forward to what he has to say 
and today of course is no exception it's a it's a special day and uh, we would like to love to have him on board uh, may i now pass the floor uh, to professor dr patrick uh, berkudan he is the uh, chief executive officer the cpf uh, managing partner uh, you have the floor uh, professor patrick Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, Distinguished Participants and Guests, warm greetings from Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and congratulations on this important event. I think you will know the GCA, the Global Center on Adaptation by now. We're the world's only international organization for adaptation. And in fact, I am joining you from the world's largest floating office in the world, our headquarters, which gives you a sense of the type of solutions we are pioneering and brokering in the adaptation domain. We're also very honored to serve as the CVF and V20's managing partner. Hosting your secretariat and collaborating with you, I'm sure we can truly accelerate adaptation action and ensure that this agenda receives the, the attention it really deserves. The GCA is a relatively new organization founded in 2018, but we're already working all over the world to put in place some of the most ambitious and bold programs ever devised for adaptation solutions at scale on the ground. One example is the 25 billion US dollar African Adaptation Acceleration Program, AAAP. It's endorsed by the African Union leaders and developed together between the African Development Bank and the GCA. It is also a template, a model for the type of bold, ambitious financing we need to see on adaptation in every region of the world. The GCA is present in your region, with the South Asia regional office hosted by the government of Bangladesh in Dhaka and a China office based in Beijing. As the GCA grows, we hope you will look to us for support and collaboration to push ahead with ambitious and game-changing adaptation initiatives. And as I'm sure you're aware, the very latest IPCC assessment report highlighted the alarming concern that global heating is undergoing an acceleration unparalleled in human history. The world is already locked into warming to 1.5 degree in just the coming decade, that is by 2030. The CVF leaders gathered in Rotterdam earlier this month at our GCA headquarters and adopted a specific manifesto for COP26. What should COP26 in Glasgow deliver? This has set the bar for what Glasgow needs to be able to deliver in order to be a success. That manifesto built on the first three CVF regional dialogues, and I'm very glad to see it reflected in a draft communique for this Asia Dialogue 2. The Climate Emergency Pact in that manifesto is a bold call to rebuild confidence in international climate cooperation, accelerate adaptation, and to keep 1.5 degrees within reach. This pact would include a vital, a vital delivery plan for the annual $100 billion in added additional climate finance for developing countries from 2020 to 2024 with a 50-50 split of funds between adaptation and mitigation. We need to mobilize these billions and move quickly to shifting the trillions into resilience investments this decade. But emergency action is also demanded of the world before 2030 to avoid surpassing 1.5 degrees during the 2030s. That's absolutely vital at this point to keep people safe. And that, I believe, is why the CVF is proposing with the Climate Emergency Pact to move to platforms of annual ambition raising at every single COP until 2025 for both mitigation and adaptation. We must absolutely keep past with this fast-moving climate emergency. Glasgow must deliver. It may be the last chance for humanity to avert climate catastrophe. And I believe the world will listen and appreciate what this forum, our forum, is calling on COP26 to deliver. 
So I congratulate you all for your remarkable efforts and I thank you again for joining us today. I wish you all a successful deliberation to this ministerial uh, regional dialogue of the CVF for Asia. Glasgow must deliver. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Patrick, for uh, sharing the work of the uh, Global Center for Adaptation and providing us a very interesting overview. Uh, we certainly need uh, much more focus, uh, much more activity, much more funding uh, when it comes to adaptation uh, based uh, programs. And we are uh, all looking forward to having a higher level of engagement with the Global Center for Adaptation. And I think, frankly, we are all inspired uh, by the very powerful example of the uh, Adaptation Accelerate program in, in Africa. And I think that works well for uh, the rest of the regions of the world. And we certainly look forward to working with you as we go along. Now, uh, we, of course, know that the forum has engaged in various uh, advocacy work, uh, including the Midnight for Survival Initiative. And I know that we as parliamentarians were also actively involved in that. And uh, if you will recall, that was launched in the sidelines of the UN General Assembly, and it was presided over by Her Excellency Sheikh Hasina, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. And the major focus uh, of this initiative was to raise awareness and also to uh, generate momentum uh, so that countries could submit enhanced and updated NDCs by December 31st, 2020. And uh, of course, that was the big deadline. And that's why we called it um, a survival initiative, a midnight survival initiative. Now, I'm very pleased uh, to be able to share a short video of this uh, initiative now that has been uh, prepared by the CVF Secretariat. Uh, so if you could have the video, please. These commitments, whether for 2030 or 2050, are not aimless targets. They are life or death deadlines. Midnight on the 31st of December 2020 is our survival deadline. We call upon all parties to fulfill their commitments under it and to submit enhanced NDCs by the end of 2020. The climate crisis is indeed an existential threat. Every nation must treat it as such. We now need to redouble our efforts before we pass the point of no return. Global greenhouse gas emissions have continued to rise and are now 43% higher than they were in 2000. We must limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees and transition to climate resilient economies. Let's aim for high ambition, zero carbon, go back to 1.5 degrees and save the planet. We have, we have to take the leadership of making prevention of climate change effects the most important public policy that we can undertake. The time to take action to save the planet is not tomorrow, but today. 2020 is the year for action. Thank you. Uh, our thanks to the city.
Thank you. That's a, that's a very sobering thought that uh, many countries uh, haven't stepped up their game. And uh, although uh, we have seen that 69, 70, 73 countries have in fact enhanced their ambitions, uh, still a lot more needs to be done. Uh, if we are going to be, uh, if we are going to limit uh, global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, I believe we are already at 1.3. Uh, so the margin or room for error is simply uh, not there anymore. So for those countries who have uh, stepped up their game, uh, we thank them for their solidarity and support. And for those that have not, um, 2021 is the year that they really need to do that. And we look forward uh, to their active engagement in this regard. Uh, so thanks again to the Secretariat for presenting that short, but very informative video. Uh, has a lot of useful information, uh, which I'm sure we can use for our advocacy purposes further as we go along. I would now like to invite, having had the initial thoughts and remarks and perspectives, uh, our keynote speaker for today, uh, Honorable Robert Chatterton Dixon, the British High Commissioner in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, I know that he is um, very passionate about this whole issue of climate partnerships. Um, I've been in sessions with him uh, in the past, and of course, the Bangladesh and UK are working together. We had the visit of the COP26 uh, president in, in Dhaka. Uh, earlier this year, and um, so we look forward to his uh, to his keynote uh, remarks. Uh, Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Saber, and uh, good afternoon, Your Excellencies. It's a great privilege to be invited to join uh, such a distinguished ministerial gathering, and in particular, uh, I'd like to say uh, greetings to uh, Mr. Dominguez, the Finance Minister of uh, of the Philippines, and to Dr. Momen, uh, the Foreign Minister of Bangladesh. And my own career started in Manila 30 years ago. Uh, I was there for the Earth Summit uh, in 1992. So it's a great pleasure to be reconnecting with the Philippines in the crucial context of uh, COP26. Um, there are really four things I'd like to say uh, about COP uh, and our ambitions for it, and the role that we see the CVF, the Climate Vulnerable Forum, playing uh, in it. And the first thing is to say uh, how much we welcome uh, all the uh, action of the Climate Vulnerable Forum to pull together the countries who have done the least uh, to create the problem, uh, but have the most to lose if the problem is not effectively tackled. So we very much welcome uh, all of the activity that's being done at regional level. We welcome the global impact that the CVF will have. And we welcome what is set out in the CVF manifesto uh, with its delivery plan uh, for the reaching the climate uh, financing target of, seven, of, of $100 billion. Uh, not there yet, but with some very good announcements in the last couple of weeks, uh, in particular at the UN General Assembly. The seven essential actions uh, for each country, which very much set out practical things that every country uh, can do if we're going to reach uh, the target. And finally, the importance that it places on youth voices, because young people are the ones who will be dealing with this problem long after those of us in the older generations have, have moved on. And so it really is crucial that young people who are so passionate about this issue and are so deeply engaged in it uh, are heard. So absolutely, completely welcome uh, the role of the CBF and in particular the leadership that is being provided by uh, the Honourable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, uh, Sheikh Hasina. The second thing I'd like to say is how important I think the in-person uh, COP is going to be. And we're working very hard uh, to make sure that despite the problems and the limitations uh, of the pandemic, we can have a really meaningful in-person summit uh, and associated meetings uh, in Glasgow now in only five weeks time. And as part of that, we're working with the UNFCC to make sure that the voices of the CVF, which as I said, have a particular resonance and a particular moral weight uh, on climate uh, are properly heard in Glasgow. Uh, and we hope to be able to make some announcements on exactly how that's going to work uh, as the final COP agenda falls into place uh, over the next few weeks. And um, the third thing I should say is how important the substance of all this is. Our own prime minister, uh, who has something of a, of a gift for setting out catchy phrases uh, at the UN General Assembly, said that what COP is really about uh, is coal, cash, cars and trees. And I think that does provide really the essence uh, of what, the, uh, what the, the world as a whole is going to have to agree on uh, in Glasgow in a few weeks time. And in particular, there are still opportunities uh, as we work towards Glasgow for further pledges 
for further action on NDCs, on net zero, on the phasing out of coal, and for the richer countries uh, on the provision of climate finance. So we're now really into the, the end game uh, of the negotiation. It's the time where we hope that everybody uh, will be putting their final offers on the table and the role of the CVF as, a, as an advocacy group uh, and an action group coordinating the most vulnerable countries clearly is absolutely crucial to that. And the final thing I'd like to mention is how welcome it is to see the Global Centre for Adaptation uh, here. Uh, as managing partner of the CVF, they obviously have a crucial um, coordinating role. And we are delighted that there is now uh, the regional headquarters for South Asia here in Dhaka. And as part of the bilateral uh, UK-Bangladesh climate partnership, which we are about to commit significant funding to, there will be an element which supports uh, the role of the, uh, of the GCA uh, here in Dhaka and supports its work uh, right across the region. So thank you very much indeed for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, it's a huge privilege and responsibility for the UK uh, to be chairing uh, COP. We were delighted by the very positive reception that Mr. Sharma, the COP president designate received when he was here uh, in Dhaka uh, earlier in the year. And we look forward to continuing to work productively with all of our partners and particularly with the CBF under Bangladeshi leadership as we enter the crucial closing stages of preparation uh, for this vital, vital summit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, High Commissioner, for those words. And I think uh, you have rightly uh, captured and echoed uh, the sentiments and aspirations of uh, the climate vulnerable foreign countries. Uh, thank you for your support and solidarity. And we hope that this is going to be infectious during COP26. And it will be a global solidarity that we will look forward to at the end of the day. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your, for your thoughts. Um, I think I'm now able to uh, call upon uh, Mohammad Nasheed, His Excellency Mohammad Nasheed, uh, he's the Speaker of the House of Matslish uh, from the Maldives, and um, I'm delighted that uh, he's able to join us. And um, so you have the floor, Excellency, for your well, remarks. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you ever so much. And I am sorry there was confusion on on the time that I should be joining in. Uh, as we uh, move to the COP. Uh, this is the final regional dialogue that the CVF is now conducting. Uh, we've had all the other regions coming together, uh, uh, putting our thoughts in, in line to see that we have a unified, a singular view as we go to the COP. Uh, I congratulate uh, Philippines, the Bangladesh chair, but the Bangladesh Prime Minister and the CVF Secretariat uh, for having done a whole lot of work all throughout the last year in trying to organize ourselves, in trying to uh, get ourselves uh, to this position. But I do not think there is any other group going to the COP that is more organized, that is more ready uh, than the CVF. Uh, the CVF have been able to uh, come with a, a, a pact, an emergency uh, pact. Uh, we feel that if we go to the COP again uh, with business as usual in mind and try to uh, enter into negotiations from the very beginning, uh, we might not end up with a reasonable result at this COP. It is very important that we do uh, have some outcomes from this COP. Uh, the CVF has suggested two main points. One is, of course, on emission. Uh, uh, we, would, we would want to see 1.5 degrees accepted by all countries. We would want to see nationally determined contributions, the ambition of countries raised to the extent that uh, uh, this is possible that 1.5 degrees uh, is adhered to. It's very sad um, as we speak, uh, the numbers are very, very low. Big emitting countries have not come up with uh, a high ambition. They have not submitted their NDCs according to the uh, press, uh, Paris Agreement. So the Paris Agreement in that sense is in default. Uh, and we would therefore urge countries to come up with their uh, a, a higher ambition. As we, as we see, as we stand now, uh, what is submitted is only 
40% of what is required. Uh, and that 40% puts us higher, uh, uh, 14, 15% higher uh, than uh, what would be needed to achieve 1.5 degrees. Now, renewable energy is now cheaper uh, in any given situation. It's not financially more viable. And therefore, we are hopeful that if countries try to relinquish the obsolete uh, old internal combustion engine and the fossil fuel technology, the old Victorian technology, uh, then it is possible for countries to switch to uh, net zero uh, planning positions and development strategies. Uh, for the uh, CBF countries, uh, we had come out with a prosperity plan, a low carbon development plan uh, that would uh, give us the same economic outcomes, uh, but with less extraction and uh, more recycling. Uh, the prosperity plans are uh, accepted uh, by some of the countries uh, and Bangladesh in this sense has uh, enacted their prosperity plan. They've declared their Mujib prosperity plan and uh, hopefully uh, private sector would come with investments uh, to the Bangladesh plan. Uh, the CBF feels that it is possible to attract investments uh, to the uh, prosperity plan uh, and uh, make uh, net zero uh, a, a complete economic reality. Uh, so uh, we are hopeful that in the in the few months, in the few weeks ahead of the COP, more countries will be able to come out uh, and declare their uh, high ambition. We also feel that in, in adaptation and the funding of 100 billion, uh, uh, the money uh, would start coming. Now, the OECD uh, has been doing the sums uh, on how much money uh, is, is received. Uh, I am afraid uh, uh, we need to have uh, CBF countries also uh, doing the audit and, and deciding on how much funds have actually realized. OECD alone doing that would be the uh, uh, same as uh, them marking their own homework in a sense. Uh, well, the CBF has suggested uh, the IMF and the World Bank with uh, uh, the inclusion of CVF countries uh, to do uh, the sums to see what money has, has realized. We also know that uh, co countries pledging uh, uh, adaptation funding and, and mitigation funding uh, doesn't actually amount to realized projects. Now, it's, it's since 2009, uh, uh, vulnerable countries have been asking for this money. And I can very clearly say, for instance, in the example of the Maldives, just no project has actually realized on the ground uh, as either an adaptation project or, or a mitigation project. Even after pledging funds, it takes so long uh, for our countries to realize them as projects. So it's not only just the question of uh, pledging the funds and, and uh, getting the satisfaction that 100 billion is on the table, but it is also more that this 100 billion would be spent uh, in adaptation, in mitigation, in vulnerable countries. Uh, the CDF has been arguing, has been uh, advocating that uh, uh, debt swaps for adaptation uh, would be a manner in which we can have the funds realizing instantly. Uh, why CBF countries are asking for uh, debt restructuring is quite very simple. Uh, most of these vulnerable countries are very heavily debt ridden and we are paying uh, up to 20% of our budget in debt repayments. Uh, and then at the same time, the heavy weather is, the bad weather is now upon us. And therefore we are now having to 
uh, pay a lot of money uh, for adaptation as well. So countries will simply not be able to do this, pay the debt and, and also spend, spend on adaptation. Uh, uh, we will, uh, we, most of our countries are in a situation, uh, there are a number of, uh, I, must, I must mention that there are a number of uh, CVF countries who do not have uh, the debt um, as such a big issue, for instance, but for Bangladesh, uh, uh, debt is not a, a big issue, but for more than half the CVF countries, uh, debt repayment is their single biggest issue. Uh, uh, when we took the loans, uh, we were told uh, that climate change impacts were, uh, were uh, a thing in the future. But the IPCC report is now very clear to suggest that uh, the impacts of uh, climate change would be upon us much quicker within, in fact, uh, the period of the loan. So we took a loan. Uh, to build a road, to build a bridge, uh, to build a house, uh, to build a school, uh, to build infrastructure. Uh, but the last year's or this year's typhoon uh, or the uh, storm surge, the sea surge or high winds or the drought um, has taken away the asset and it has become stranded. So the assets created uh, by the loans are now very highly stranded by bad because of bad weather, and it would be very difficult for us to pay back these loans. We, we really need to acknowledge, we really need to know that in the next few years, we will be in a very difficult situation whereby we will not be able to pay back the loans and we will go into default. Now, uh, my... Uh, our finance ministers would find it very difficult to say this because they are finance ministers and because they have to spend, they have to sell their treasury bonds uh, uh, and, and their treasury bills and their government bonds even tomorrow. And if they say that they need to restructure their debt, the markets would downgrade this. Now, CVF has been suggesting ways on how to go about this restructuring and swapping uh, the debt to climate resilient projects. So uh, we are hopeful that debt restructuring, debt swapping also would become a, a conversation uh, topic uh, in the COP. So it's mitigation in terms of mitigation, again, uh, to recap, uh, 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 the money has not, uh, sorry, the, the ambition has not arrived. Countries have not uh, uh, lodged their NDCs to the extent that is required, to the extent that the science is suggesting. And in terms of the funding, the money, A, the money is not actually pledged, B, even when, they, when it is pledged, it's very difficult to realize. Uh, it's very slow in realizing. And finally, we have the issue of our debts and that has to be sorted. Well, uh, uh, I am sorry, that we do not have a very uh, uh, positive or uh, 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 an optimistic picture as we go to this COP. Uh, but uh, what I am uh, extremely happy about is the fact that Bangladesh has given leadership, has got this thing sorted, organized, uh, and uh, have, are in a position now to go to Glasgow with a darker Glasgow declaration that would be speaking on behalf of 48 climate, most climate vulnerable countries. Uh, we do not think the CVF is not with the view that the COP should happen business as usual. We think they should instantly and immediately start negotiating uh, the climate emergency pact. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. And I am sorry, there was some confusion on the time uh, that I should be uh, speaking. Uh, um, uh, it's seven in the morning for me, uh, but uh, there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your thank Excellency. You, Sabir, thank you, Sabir, uh, 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 for bringing the whole thing together uh, uh, and, 
and having the conversation. And thank you also, Philippines, uh, uh, for uh, hosting uh, the, the Asia group. Uh, this is the last group of dialogue. Uh, last, this is the last uh, regional. Uh, group dialogue, regional dialogue. And, and when this is done, the format is that we would hopefully all be able to go to Bangladesh uh, and sit around and then uh, go to Glasgow uh, uh, with what is agreed in regional dialogues. Uh, just also tomorrow in London, all the CVF ambassadors uh, and, and high commissioners are, bound, uh, are, are uh, planned to meet. We will meet in London tomorrow and have another discussion again uh, on the gravity of the issue and what is in front of us. Uh, well, I thank everyone. I thank Azad, uh, uh, the climate change special envoy of Prime Minister uh, Hasina, uh, uh, the, the, the Minister Muin, and also the Finance Minister Kamal. Um, all of you have been just amazing in bringing this together. And our colleagues, um, Matthew, and the staff at the CVF. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. And although you're in uh, London, you know, the sun uh, has also, uh, out of respect, uh, come out and greeted you in the morning as it would in the Maldives. Um, of course, we, we met for the first time uh, during the uh, Copenhagen COP. Uh, there was an event organized by the Danish parliament in concert with the IPU. And I was, uh, I was really looking forward to meeting uh, President Nasheed uh, because he had just uh, convened prior to the uh, COP15, uh, the first ever, and I believe it is uh, the only uh, cabinet meeting to have taken place uh, under the water, uh, which was really a very uh, desperate uh, SOS for help because uh, the existence of Maldives and many other small island, um, uh, low-lying uh, areas are going to be submerged and uh, it's a very threat to their existence. And today also you have shared with us your thoughts. Uh, you've talked about the debt issue for a number of times. And uh, I believe that this is something that will have traction amongst the CDF countries. And we look forward to working closely with you. And of course, having you uh, with us when it comes to the CDF parliamentary group launch, uh, which is going to be hopefully uh, during the course of uh, next month. Uh, now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, distinguished participants, uh, we are heading towards the end of this segment. Uh, prior to that, we have the reporting part. And uh, to uh, at least uh, finish off my um, responsibilities today and continue with the agenda, we will have the reporting session. Uh, it's been presented by Mr. Neil uh, Kabilesk, um, Director in the International Finance Group, Department of Finance, Republic of the Philippines. Uh, Neil, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, esteemed colleagues um, of the CVF. The Climate Vulnerable, Vulnerable Forum, CVF Asia Dialogue 2021, is the third in a series of CVF regional dialogues being convened by the forum to identify an up-to-date understanding of the types of challenges, successes, needs, and gaps that the region's most vulnerable developing eco economies and nations face as they work to implement climate change policies and tackle the growing global challenge of the climate crisis amid the response and recovery to the COVID-19 pandemic. Yesterday, the meeting of experts started the process of finalizing the CVF regional communique outlining regional perspectives on climate action. The dialogue highlighted the devastating impacts that climate change has historically caused in Asia, causing significant damages to vulnerable populations, impacting their populations and the economy. The meeting highlighted how climate action is mutually beneficial to different economies and explored areas of convergence between the respective groups. Among the areas of convergence identified were the following. Number one, delivery of the 100 US billion dollar climate financing. Provision of the annual commitment of developed country parties to mobilize 100, million US, 100 billion US dollars 
in climate finance annually to developing countries is critical for enabling action and sustaining trust in international cooperation. Number two, greater ambition from major emitters. The social, environmental, and economic security of Asia requires safeguarding of the 1.5 the 1.5 degrees Paris Agreement goal to limit warming. Even 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming poses catastrophic risks for the region. Number three, imperative of new financing. According to the Global Commission on Adaptation, on adaptation financing needs for adaptation and resilience are, are at about 1.7 trillion US dollars per year for the least developed small islands, and vulnerable middle-income countries. Number four, loss and damage. In addition to the need for financing of loss and damage, COP26 needs to place a higher level of prioritization on loss and damage and on the work of the Warsaw International Mechanism. Number five, at COP26, we need to finalize robust carbon markets consistent with the 1.5 degrees Celsius to unlock new finance streams, while the carbon markets regime should raise 5% proceeds to support the adaptation actions of developing countries, particularly those vulnerable to climate change. Number six on adaptation. We call for real action in the form of increase, increased financing for adaptation, removal of barriers to technology transfers and investment and incapacity development. Number seven, on maritime GHG emissions. We recognize the critical importance of shipping to our states and to prioritize and support all efforts to advocate for this sector to commit to an equitable transition to zero emission by at, by at least 2050 that leaves no one behind. We support fully the current submissions to the International Maritime Organization, or IMO, MEPC 77, which calls for the IMO to adopt this as an overarching sectoral target and endorse urgent and close consideration by IMO of the mandatory GHG levy on international shipping proposed by RMI and Solomon Islands. Maritime zones, number eight. Securing our maritime zones against the threat of climate change-related sea level rise and preserving our existing rights and entitlements stemming from maritime zones. Number nine on oceans. We reaffirm our commitment to sustainably manage, use, and conserve our ocean within and beyond national jurisdiction to ensure its health, productivity, resilience, and safety. This will be based on the best available scientific information and traditional challenge. This includes taking into account ecological and cultural connectivity when designing and establishing conservation and management measures and areas-based areas management measures, including mar marine protected areas. Number 10, no new coal. We strongly support the call of the United Nations Secretary General for an end to the international financing of coal plants and for a shift in finance and investment to renewable energy projects. Number 11, worker protection and jobs. We call upon partners to consider the need for urgent capacity, finance, technology, and technical assistance to help protect workers in the Asian region exposed that are exposed dangerous to, the dangerous, to dangerous effects due to climate change. Number 12, displacement and migration. We call upon increased support to the Asian region to help the most vulnerable communities to increase their resilience to disasters and slow onset erosion due to climate change. Number 13, human rights. We call on the 48th Human Rights Council session to take the necessary action to establish this vital mandate. This is an urgent need for the most vulnerable given the importance of human rights in the climate crisis and the, and the planetary emergency that is already an increasingly 
that is already an increasingly threatening and, undermi and undermining the rights of all our people. Number 14, parliaments. We encourage the active engagement of parliamentarians of the Asia of, of the Asian region in the CVF Parliamentary Forum to benefit from the exchange of legislative good practices for effective national and locally, locally led efforts on climate change. Emphasizing the importance of mobilizing resources and investment assigned to, spe assigned to specifically to adaptation and loss and damages and of securing robust economic development as well as safeguarding swift regional progress towards fulfillment of the 2030 Sustainable Goals, we welcome the new program of Climate Prosperity Plans launched by, Bangla by the Bangladesh CVF Presidency. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, esteemed colleagues. These were the, um, these were the points that have been raised and um, have been supported in the past meetings for the, for the last two days. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil, for that uh, very focused and a very precise summary. I think uh, it's very evident uh, from the uh, 14 points that you have uh, set out um, how productive your deliberations have been. And uh, we certainly look forward to incorporating these in the overall um, document that the CBF is going to produce uh, uh, prior to the COP26. Uh, now, um, we have almost come, at least I have come to the uh, end of uh, my responsibilities in terms of moderating the session today. Uh, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure and a privilege uh, to be with you. And, uh, and thank you for being uh, with me throughout the morning. Uh, I would now like to hand over the moderation responsibilities uh, to Her Excellency, Ms. Paolo Alvarez. She's the Assistant Secretary, Department of Finance. Um, Excellency, the floor is yours and uh, I take leave uh, for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Chowdhury, and thank you for providing a very good moderator uh, for the, the, the morning session. Uh, honorable co-chair, excellencies, honorable ministers, distinguished participants and guests, welcome to the ministerial roundtable of the CVF Asia Regional Dialogue 2021. So I am Paula Alvarez, Assistant Secretary of the Department of Finance of the Philippines, and I'm joining you live from Manila. So I would like to begin this segment by extending my warmest welcome and greeting to each and every one of you, distinguished representatives of the member countries of the CBF and the B20, to the honorable members and observer countries and the distinguished representatives of the partner organizations of the CBF and B20 participating in this dialogue, co-organized by the Honorable People's Republic of Bangladesh in its capacity as chair of the CBF B20 together with the Troika member. So to proceed with the program, in this ministerial roundtable, we will first hear from the honorable ministers of the country members of the CBF. Then we will proceed with the statements from the honorable ministers of the observer countries. And afterwards, we will have the statements from the CBF partners. So at this juncture, may we call on the CBF secretariat to help us uh, in calling out the members of the CPF for their respective statements. Uh, thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Paula. Uh, we will now start the segment with a representative. Was a representative of with the representatives of Cambodia, His Excellency Dr. Tin Ponok, Secretary of the State of the Minister of Environment of Cambodia. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to join you virtually today for this important event. On behalf of Excellency Sai Samal, Minister of Environment, I would like to express my sincere thanks for inviting Cambodia to deliver remarks in this important event. 
Cambodia, like other countries in the world, has experienced adverse impacts of climate change, which resulted in significant losses of human life, assets, and ecosystems. As party to the UNCCC, Cambodia is doing her share and has adhered to the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capacities. The country endorsed a climate change strategic plan 2014-2020 23, aiming to guide Cambodia towards a green, low carbon, climate resilient, equitable, sustainable, and knowledge based society. We are also fully participating in the global climate change effort by updating our NDC, which was submitted in late 2020. While Cambodia is a very small contributor to global GHG emissions, we want to share our commitment in line with our resources and capacities. We are currently developing a long-term strategy for carbon neutrality. The year 2020 and 21 have been very tough years for our economies and societies. The health measures we have taken in Cambodia have successfully contained the spread of the, the pandemic. However, we need to allocate a large share of our resources to address the the continuing economic and social impact of this global disaster. Entire sector of our economy requires temporary support. In the meantime, Cambodia continues to be severely impacted by climate change. Unpredictable rainfall patterns and more frequent drought affect our agriculture and fisheries. The combined impact of climate change and COVID-19 have severely affected the livelihoods of our most vulnerable citizens and we have put in place large cash transfer programs to minimize these impacts. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, although Cambodia has been hit hard by this combined economic and climate change crisis, we are taking decisive action to stay on course and to meet our sustainable development goals. However, this external crisis come on top of all the development challenges that we need to address as a developing country. Decisive global actions and support from our international partners will be essential if we want to meet these formidable challenges. In this regard, allow me to leave two important messages uh, with you today. First, I urge our partners and particularly high emitting countries to increase their level of ambition before COP26. Despite some progress, we have seen that pledges made so far are insufficient to reach the goal of two degrees Celsius increase in temperature and even further away from the 1.5 degree objective. Developing countries cannot afford a worsening climate change crisis on top of all the other development challenges uh, they are facing. Green technologies offer opportunities to boost economic recovery, create jobs, combat climate change, and contribute to achieving sustainable development goals. My second message is a call to step up financing for climate change adaptation. In recent months, we have seen how interconnected our economies and societies are. We must work together to strengthen the resilience of our economies and protect the most vulnerable among us. Access to adaptation funds remains too limited and complicated, partic particularly for least developed countries. This investment in adaptation will help us prevent much larger impacts of climate change on the global economy, and they must be made known. I would like to end by thanking the government of Bangladesh the government of the Philippines and the CBF Secretariat for their relentless commitment and advocacy for ambitious climate change action. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your encouraging remark. Uh, your Excellency Tim Onlok, Secretary of State of the Ministry of Environment. Uh, now, we'd like to turn the floor over to His Excellency uh, Minat Shauna, Minister of Environment, Climate Change and Technology of Maldives. Your Excellency, the floor is yours.
Hello uh, and very good morning, ministers and excellencies, distinguished speakers and participants, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning to you all. Let me begin by thanking the current chair of CVF, the government of Bangladesh, for organizing this important meeting at this very crucial time. Today, we are all facing the climate crisis and none of us are immune from its adverse impacts, which is threatening lives and livelihoods of many countries around the world. Extreme events are on the rise. For example, last year was among the hottest years on record and damages associated with the extremes are mounting in all parts of the world. The science shows that without effective and urgent action, extreme events will increase and its frequency and magnitude associated with extreme events and more frequent events and de devastating impacts. And the science is so clear, the latest IPCC report is code red for all of us. For the low lying vulnerable countries like the Maldives, climate change is not just a threat anymore, it's already here. More than 80% of our islands are less than just a meter above mean sea level. 90% of our islands report flooding annually, and 97% report shoreline erosion. Everything is at stake for us, our income, our food systems, our water resources, and our survival depends on climate-related vulnerabilities. But our contribution to global warming is negligible. However, we don't want to only be victims, we also want to be victims. We are determined to be part of the global solution by undertaking ambitious climate action and committing to achieve low emission development and a climate resilient future. In the Maldives, we have an ambitious target to reach net zero by 2030. And to reach this target, extensive support is needed from our development partners. We are also working with the CVF to formulate a prosperity plan for the Maldives, and we hope to finalize this ahead of the COP. We're making plans to shift our economy from running on diesel to running on sunshine. We're committed to protecting our reefs, mangroves, and ecologically significant areas by 20% by 2030. We have made plans to phase out single-use plastics by 2023. And the real action is happening on the ground. However, we cannot do this unilaterally. Regional and global cooperation is really key to success. Distinguished colleagues, the Maldives firmly believes that implementation of ambitious climate action can only be achieved by the provision of adequate, predictable, and sustainable financing from developed countries to developing countries, especially for LDCs and SIDS. Although mitigation actions are an important and significant pillar in addressing climate change, the Maldives, along with other vulnerable countries, have consistently been calling for fulfillment of obligations under the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement to seek a balance between both mitigation and adaptation finance. To this end, we would like to see more concrete action towards facilitating grant-based finance for adaptation and resilient building in our countries. We are also particularly concerned about the issue of increased debt burden for our country. Given the impact of COVID, we are even more worried about this. Despite our efforts to raise finance for adaptation for multilateral partners, we have not had much luck. We call on international financial institutions to constructively engage to change this as we cannot keep funding our adaptation by borrowing from commercial banks. It's disheartening to see we are still far from, from the goal to mobilize $100 billion annually by 2020. Distinguished colleagues, the upcoming, 26, upcoming COP26 is crucial. We cannot afford further delays without reaching a meaningful progress. We all need to wrap up all outstanding items to kickstart the full implementation of Paris Agreement at the earliest. As vulnerable nations, more emphasis on loss and damage need to be one of our main priorities. 
the operationalization of Santiago Network on loss and damage, the necessary finance and support for longer term transformational funds to address the impact of slow onset events such as sea level rise and addressing post disaster relief response and capacity building to deal with the projected frequent climate impacts are a must for us now. It's no longer our choice. Although many efforts are being undertaken, we still lack proper support to implement our national adaptation plans. I strongly believe the COP need to have further discussions on how urgent support can be mobilized to implement the adaptation actions to address immediate adaptation needs. And of course, most importantly, the $100 billion finance goal. Let me conclude by assuring our full support and commitments towards making this upcoming COP26 a success. And I thank the CVF for their continuous efforts to make this a success as well. I'd like to once again thank the organizers for this important discussion in our region. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, remarks, uh, Minister Shauna. And the Philippines is one with you in supporting the ban for single-use plastics, as well as pushing for the Santiago Network on loss and damage, as well as the efficient and quick mobilization or finance for adaptation needs. So at this juncture, we would now request uh, His Excellency, Dr. Prem Narayan Kendall, Secretary of the Ministry of Forests and Environment of Nepal. Your Excellency, the floor is now yours. Uh, Secretariat, may we seek assistance if the Honorable Minister is having uh, connection problems? It looks like they're having a connection problem, so we can pass to the next speaker. Uh, excuse me. Are you, are, yeah. did you manage to connect? Yeah. Now, yeah, I will do it on behalf of you. Okay, thank you. Uh, honorable ministers, excellencies, distinguished guests and participants. Let me thank the organizer and current chair of CBF Bangladesh for convening this timely event to let deliberate on an urgent issue of climate change in the lead up to COP26 at Glasgow. This dialogue provides us an excellent opportunity to collaborate on the common issue and integrate our agendas and priorities, priorities for the purpose of effective negotiation during the COP26. The vision set by CBF for all the nations to limit the rise of global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius from that of pre-industrial level is a critical target set for all of us. That is an achievable target if we all act in concrete, if we align our policies and actions in harmony for a greener, more sustainable future, and if we walk, or walk the talk to implement our commitments. If we fail, we will collectively fail the planet and our future generations. To achieve the target, the climate vulnerable countries stand in dire need of easy and predictable availability and access to climate finance and affordable greener and cleaner technology. On our part, the government of Nepal submitted its ambitious second NDC in December 2020 under the Paris Agreement. This contains qualified and policy-based mitigation targets and adaptation priorities with time frame of uh, 2020 to 2025. We are committed to achieve a net zero emissions by 2050 through the implementation of loss and damage national framework climate finance strategic roadmap and second nationally determined contribution implementation plan, among others. We have taken nation 
is a whole approach the agenda of reducing the impact of climate change through adaptation and mitigation measures has been fully integrated in the policies plans and programs down to the provincial and local levels as well distinguished coaches the himalayas have served as water towers of asia and supply water to the 1.3 billion people downstream nepal's snow fed rivers nourish the basins and ultimately contributing to the ocean ecosystem signifying the organic uh, linkage between mountains and the oceans however mountains nations have unique ecosystem and livelihood vulnerability challenges attributed to climate change furthermore mountains and their role is building resilience do not find adequate space in climate change negotiation therefore the sdgs and environmental targets in particular matter the most the challenges posed by the pandemic has further hurdled uh, the process of achieving such targets we must learn the lessons and ensure sustainable and inclusive economic growth and build resilience the key to climate change action in vulnerable countries rests in access to climate financing affordable technology and implementable adaptation and mitigation programs we expect that the developed countries will further uh, will, uh, will uh, fulfill their collective pledge of mobilizing 100 billion annually for climate action in developing and least developed countries we further urge developed countries to raise their climate finance ambitions too uh, as this um, is an investment for the people and the planet we urge all countries in particular the developed and major emitter ones to fulfill their paris agreement com commitments by starting with implementation and bringing increase emission in the next round of nationally determined contributions let's build a stronger partnership to ensure that uh, we will be able to limit global temperature to 1.5 degrees celsius and to build up resilience nepal looks forward to building a coalition of like minded countries on mountain issues for negotiation in cop 26 for this nepal always stands ready to collaborate and build a stronger partnership i thank you Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your intervention. And we note and support your uh, call for access for affordable and clean, clean and green technology, as well as crafting the framework for a loss and jam damage and building on resilience for communities in mountainous regions. Now, uh, we would now like to give the floor to His Excellency, Demetrio de Amaral de Carvalho, Secretary of State, of the for the environment of Timor Leste. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Secretariat, may we seek assistance if His Excellency Demetrio Carvalho has access to the platform? Uh, we're, we're checking with them in the meantime. I think we can pass to the statement by Bhutan and we'll check if they can reconnect. Okay, thank you. So while waiting, may we now uh, give the floor to Mr. Tulga Man. Mandahargal, Director of the International Cooperation Division of the Ministry of Environment and Tourism of Mongolia. The floor is yours, Excellency. Mm. Hello. Esteemed ambassadors, co-hosts, and delegates, and ladies and gentlemen, warmest uh, greetings from Mongolia. Uh, it's my great pleasure to remark on behalf of the Minister of Environment and Tourism of Mongolia, Ms. Oshnasang Yamjau, on this important event. As one of the vulnerable countries, Mongolia has been actively engaged in the addressing climate change agendas with 
uni united efforts. From the beginning, Mongolia supported the Climate Vulnerable Forum and has been an active member since. As in other uh, climate vulnerable country, the impacts of escalating global warming are evident in Mongolia. The annual mean and uh, mean air temperature increased by uh, 2.25 degrees Celsius. Annual precipitation increased 76.9% uh, of the territory is affected by desertification. Glaciers shrunk by 30%, and natural disaster doubled in the occurrence during the past eight years. Consequently, such a phenomena as drought conditions, water shortage, soil erosion, desertification, etc., et are amplified, especially since year 2000. The economy of the country and the food security of the population majorly depend on the agricultural sector. Therefore, in general, the social economy of the country is adversely affected by climate change. For this reason, the government of Mongolia is prioritizing the climate change agenda in its long and short term strategies. The newly adopted NDC to Paris Agreement set a more ambitious target to the uh, 22 0.7% greenhouse gas emission reduction by 30, uh, 2030. These include important economic sectors as energy, construction, transportation, agriculture, industry, waste, and the forest. On the other hand, the NDC emphasizes adaptation measures as key. The government identified that water, forest, agriculture, biodiversity, uh, disaster reduction livelihood sector require heightened attention as an adaptive measure. The implementation of these measures requires a tremendous effort and additional resources need to be mobilized. Mongolia considers the multilateral and uh, bilateral cooperation which play a major role in this endeavor. We believe the suggested Asia Regional Community fully covers all the important agendas that need to be addressed during the upcoming COP26. Therefore, Mongolia as a member of the Climate Vulnerable Forum supports and endorses the community and its adoption. Mongolia will continue to actively engage in the Climate Vulnerable Forum initiatives and look forward to achieving even more constructive cooperation in this vital period. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Tuga. Uh, now may we inquire if His Excellency, Honorable Demetrio do Amaral de Carvalho is already on the line. Okay, uh, seeing that we still do not have him, may we now have uh, the statement of His Excellency, Dr. Tandi Torji, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bhutan, who will be participating through a pre-recorded video. So, Secretariat. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you the warm greetings of the Royal Government and people of Bhutan. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to the governments of Bangladesh and the Philippines for convening this very important Asia Regional Dialogue of the Climate Vulnerable Forum and for inviting me to participate in it. The science is robust and clear. The latest IPCC report is a reconfirmation of the 1.5 degree Celsius target set out in the Paris Agreement, a target which all of us must come together and strive to achieve. Bhutan, on our part, continues to do all it can towards this endeavor. Under the visionary leadership of our monarchs, Bhutan has always strived to play its role in this global drive to address climate change. We have pledged to remain carbon neutral and our constitution mandates that we maintain a minimum of 60% of forest coverage for all times to come. All of these have been possible due to our successive monarchs' unwavering commitment towards ensuring environmental conservation 
and fighting climate change. Despite being a carbon negative country and of all our efforts, we have not been spared from the devastating impacts of climate change, which destroy our infrastructure and agricultural lands and risks human lives and settlements. With each passing year, unusual weather events are on the rise, which vulnerable countries like ours have to grapple with. This year alone, several precious lives were lost here in my country to sudden flash floods triggered by unusually heavy rainfall. Therefore, our topmost priority continues to remain that of adaptation and building resilience to climate change. We must improve the coping capacities of our communities to adapt to the effects of climate change, build their resilience and reduce vulnerabilities. Further, we need support from international communities, both in terms of finance and technology. Not only is the delivery of the US 100 billion annually critical, but making it easily accessible is essential for us. What is even more important is that no poor and vulnerable countries should be forced to take loans to address the impacts of climate change. We believe that all climate finance must be grant-based. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Every action counts and every fraction of a degree in temperature increase matters. The survival of millions of people across the world and especially in vulnerable developing countries such as ours depends on our actions. The world cannot afford to move at the current trajectory. Rather, we must all ramp up collectively in our action to achieve a 1.5 degree Celsius world while we still have the chance. Otherwise, we may be too late. Thank you and touch the lid. Thank you very much for that very inspiring speech, Honorable Minister. And we highlight the zero emissions by Bhutan, but at the same time, it is still a highly vulnerable country. And your call for mobilization of finance and technology to help uh, developing countries better adapt to climate change. Uh, at this juncture, uh, may we now open the floor to our observer countries, if they would like to make any statement, please raise your hand so we may call on you. Maybe we seek the Secretariat to assist us in calling out the observer countries. We have not seen anyone that has raised hand, so we can move to the next segment, which is the partner countries, partner organizations. So we now open the floor to our partner organizations. Uh, the CVF works with different partners and they are here to say a few words. So let's start with Professor Walter Kalin. Envoy of the Chair of the Platform on Disaster Displacement. Professor Walter, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you so much, Chair. Can you please confirm that you hear me okay? I'm calling in from Geneva, Switzerland. Yes, we hear you. Thank you. Chairperson, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Chair of the Platform on Disaster Displacement, the Government of Fiji, let me thank you for the invitation for the Platform on Disaster Displacement to take the floor in this ministerial segment. My name is Atle Solberg, and I deliver this statement on behalf of the envoy of the chair of the Platform on Disaster Displacement, Professor Walter Kalen, in my capacity as head of the PDD Secretariat in Geneva. The PDD is a state-led initiative focusing on the implementation of the Nansen Initiative Agenda for the protection of cross-border displaced persons in the context of disasters and climate change. We work towards better protection for people displaced in the context of disaster and climate change, as well as more effective prevention of such displacement. We are proud to be partner of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, and we are pleased to engage with Climate Vulnerable Forum countries particularly today at the regional dialogue in Asia. We are happy to see both the Philippines and Bangladesh, members of our steering group hosting and leading in this important event. We are also pleased to see the Maldives, another member of our steering group participating in this event. The PDD has been involved in fostering cooperation amongst key stakeholders in the region, 
bringing together partners from Asia and the Pacific for a regional workshop on disaster risk reduction, preparedness, and disaster displacement, hosted by the government of the Philippines in Bohol, the Philippines in 2018, as well as facilitating consultation on the report of the United Nations Secretary General's High Level Panel on Internal Displacement. The report to the Secretary General will be launched in New York later today. We do hope that our engagement and partnership in Asia on activities to improve knowledge on disaster and climate change related displacement, the sharing of effective practices and developing effective policy responses will draw attention to the need for bold action on disaster displacement. We all know that the impact of climate change, including displacement, are already occurring and in particular in Asia. According to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, IDMC, in 2020 alone, both the Philippines and Bangladesh witnessed approximately 4.4 million new displacement due to disaster. An experience which will resonate with all Climate Vulnerable Forum members represented here today. Furthermore, the World Bank projects that without concrete climate and development action in South Asia, and the East Asia and the Pacific region, climate change could lead to almost 19 million new in internal displacement by 2050. To respond to these huge challenges, we must use all available policy tools to avert, minimize, and address displacement in the context of the adverse effect of climate change. Therefore, in the lead up to and during the forthcoming 26th conference of the parties in Glasgow of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the PDD will be advocating for the need to scale up action and support to avert, minimize and address a displacement related to the adverse effect of climate change. These measures include ensuring the implementation of the 2015 Paris Agreement temperature goal, increasing ambition in nationally determine contribution and national adaptation plans and step up action to reach the Paris Agreement goal, global goal on adaptation, helping people affected by disasters to move out of harm's way in safety and with dignity, and addressing the protection and assistance needs of people displaced in the context of the adverse effect of climate change. At the conference of the parties, the platform on disaster displacement will also recommend that parties one, recall and reiterate support for implementation of the Warsaw International Mechanism Executive Committee 2018 recommendation on integrated approaches to avert, minimize and address displacement related to the adverse effect of climate change. Second, support operationalization of the Santiago Network for loss and damage. And thirdly, increase access to sustainable and predictable climate financing to avert, minimize and address displacement related to the adverse effect of climate change. Ahead of COP26, through these regional dialogues, it is timely to launch another joint call for robust and ambitious climate action. We must be ambitious in calling for parties to catalyze action and support for the countries and communities who are most vulnerable to the adverse effect of climate change, cutting across mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage. And finally, it is crucial to systematically and explicitly integrate and make mainstream disaster displacement con consideration in all aspects of climate action. We stand ready to support you in your joint efforts. I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Walter. Uh, I will now pass the floor to Mrs. Caroline Dumas, Special Envoy for Migration and Climate Action of the International Organization for Migration. Uh, Mrs. Caroline, uh, you have the floor. Secretariat, may we clarify if Mrs. Caroline is able to join? Uh, yes, Mrs. Caroline is able to join. She might be having 
uh, trouble connecting. So what we could do is we could go to the next speaker and give her a chance before we conclude the partnership segment. Okay, thank you. Uh, now uh, let me let us call on Dr. Frank Riss Berman, Global Green Growth Adaptation. Dr. Frank, floor is yours. Your Excellencies, Ministers representing climate vulnerable countries in the Asia region, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to the Climate Vulnerable Forum Asia Regional Dialogue on behalf of the Global Green Growth Institute, GDGI. GDGI is an intergovernmental organization dedicated to support its 40 member and partner countries, including many in Asia, in their green transition. To that end, we have supported 29 countries in their preparation of improved NDCs to the Paris Agreement, and we are supporting countries to develop green investment projects to implement these indices and then to mobilize green and climate finance for their implementation. Over the last five years, we have mobilized over 2 billion US dollars in green and climate finance for a broad range of climate relevant projects, and we target to mobilize over $16 billion by 2030. There is a strong focus on Asian countries to reduce emissions and particularly to power past coal as a key part of the global effort to achieve net zero by 2050 and to reduce emissions by 45 to 50 percent already by 2030. While that will require an enormous effort, it should not detract from the high vulnerability to the climate crisis for many Asian countries. For GDGI, we commit to increasing our focus on climate adaptation, to reach a balance between mitigation and adaptation, recognizing that our efforts are still too often dominated by a focus on emission reduction. GDGI has been nominated as a delivery partner for the readiness program of the Green Climate Fund by the NDAs of over 30 countries. And we are committed to increase the share of direct access and the share of adaptation project funding in the investment projects that we prepare for submission to GCF. GGI believes that nature-based solutions and climate smart agriculture are a key priority for climate action. And we also express our support for the 30 by 30 target to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. We believe this target can not only help solve the climate crisis while protecting biodiversity, it can also generate a large number of green jobs, particularly for the poor and vulnerable communities whose livelihoods depend on the natural resource base. An analysis by GGI published earlier this month showed that meeting the quantifiable forest-related targets in the NDC commitments of the 14 GDGI member countries that have such quantified forest targets in their NDCs would lead to an estimated 30 to 40 million green job years in the 11-year period to 2030. Forest-related investments can generate 300 to 600 direct job years per million US dollar invested. That is 15 times more than the job years generated by renewable energy investments that themselves produce two to three times more jobs than their fossil fuel alternatives. GDGI believes that this is just one example of attractive green recovery projects that countries in Asia can and should pursue in coming years. I thank you for the opportunity to address you and assure you of GDGI's support for the climate vulnerable nations in Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frank. And now can we pass the floor to Barbara Hahn, Chair of Global Renewables Congress. It's a great honor to have the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you for, for that. I'm Bärbel Hahn. Um, I was more than 30 years in politics. Um, 10 years as a minister and 12 years as member of federal parliament in Germany. And um, I'm a specialist in the issues of uh, climate 
energy transition in all sectors and agriculture and environment. And today I'm speaking to you as chair of the Global Renewable Congress. And that is a network of, of parliamentarians worldwide um, who have the goal of 100% renewables to combat climate change. And uh, for us, parliamentarians are very important in this process because they have they are the bridge between the national level uh, to make the legislation at the local level to implement renewables there in uh, the local re in, in the regions there. And especially here in Germany, the parliamentarians uh, were um, the key driver of the energy transition here. And our network, is cross party, that's very important, and cross country. And we would like to exchange ideas and learn from each other. And we are coming from all continents and many countries. And that's a moment I would like uh, to deliver my congratulation to Bangladesh and especially uh, Honorable Minister Shuduri because they. Um, they created or developed um, the climate prosperity plan uh, for Bangladesh and the first one in the climate vulnerable forum. And I think this idea of prosperity is very important to show the benefits of renewables. We saw that in Germany, so we have 300 to uh, 50,000 new jobs created in this sector and um, we have less imports of oil and coal and uh, gas and so we save money and can spend it in our own country In the last year 2020 uh, we uh, had more than half of our electricity production were coming from our renewables in germany and that is really the first year we reached this goal um, but the time is running and uh, in November we have the COP26 in Glasgow and we see that we are far away from our goals and Paris Agreement. So um, the world is moving towards uh, 2.7 degrees warming and not 1.5 as we decided in Paris. Um, and the NECs are not very ambitious. And for example, the finance um, commitments for the Green Climate Fund, they are far away from the goals. And that is so important to have this conference because as a climate vulnerable countries, they are suffering most. And so it's important to find a common strategy for COP26. And I would say good luck for this because we have no time to lose and um, we have to act and we have to act now. Thank you for that message, Barbell. And now we have come to the adoption and launch of the CVF Asia Regional Communique and conclusion of the meeting. So the CVF Asia Regional Dialogue started on the 27th of September. In the past two days, the meeting of experts started the process of finalizing a CVF Regional Communique outlining regional perspectives on climate action to build momentum and awareness around the CVF's agenda in the region and beyond, and shared agreement on future climate change policy priorities. The dialogue built towards a global senior officials meeting of the CVF to be hosted by Bangladesh in 11 to 13th of October of 2021, which itself will collectively review the findings of all the regional dialogues and finalize a DACA Glasgow declaration of the CVF to be adopted at the CVF high level meeting that will be held UNF Triple C COP26 at Glasgow in November 2021. In the past two days, we have been having permanent contact with the different delegations to successfully finalize the regional communique. I now present the regional communique for your valuable consideration. And if there is no consideration regarding this text, I will be glad to declare the regional communique adopted but maybe hear from the Secretariat. Okay. Oh, we're so, not seeing any hands. Okay. So here uh, okay. can I can I mention something? Uh, 
yes. Uh, okay, so President Nasheed, yes, sir, you are recognized. The floor is yours. Well, uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, this is a very important moment because this is the final uh, regional dialogue and the final communique in, in that regard. Harriet will now consolidate uh, all the uh, announcements, pronouncements uh, from the regional dialogues. And as you pointed out, take that to Dhaka and then again consolidate all the points to a singular declaration and take that declaration to the COP. Now, as I previously also stated, no other group uh, has a singular view as they go to the COP. Uh, the CVF has one and the CVF therefore can be more articulate and they can advocate uh, on behalf of their own countries and on also on behalf of the group. Again, uh, I thank you, uh, the Asia group and all the other groups uh, that have got together uh, in, in this last one year in coming out with the uh, regional declarations. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much for those words of encouragement, President Nasheed. And we see Mrs. Dumas already on the line. Uh, Ma'am, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. And, and um, just a few words, I mean, to honorable ministers, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. Just to say very quickly that, as we know, I mean, Asia is a region known for its diversity um, in, in different aspects, social, cultural, political, economic. But the region, as every, everyone has said, is facing the same challenges in terms of uh, climate emergencies and uh, population and people moving uh, under that pressure. Um, Asia is highly exposed to climatic extreme events such as storms, floods, and uh, you have uh, as well severely affected populations by slow onset events and processes. I just would like to, to, to add at the end of the meeting that we feel as IOM that immediate action is needed. Uh, the international community can no longer design migration policy without taking into account the environment, environmental state of the planet. And similarly, climate change policy cannot be implemented without planning for migration. So as far as IOM is concerned, we would like to assure you that uh, climate change and human mobility is a key priority. Our, our position now is to go to the COP with a few priorities. Firstly, ask the international community to include human mobility in climate policies. Second, call for an urgent need for more adaptation, action, measures and targeted finance. Third, I mean to step up, uh, step up sorry, international support to the most vulnerable, precisely countries and people with predictable and sustainable finance, working on both adaptation solutions and loss and damage at local, national, regional level. And fourth, call for a more inclusive mobilization of all public, private, uh, sectors, but as well the voices of the migrants. So you can count on us in um, that next COP in Glasgow. And we, we, of course, cherish the partnership with the CVF and more specifically the Climate Vulnerable Trust Fund. So I, I'm, I will be ready to meet uh, any representative of the CVF either in Milan, if you are, or in Glasgow. And my director general, the director general of IOM, Mr. Vittorino, will be as well very glad to, to, to have conversation, deeper conversation with um, either the presidency of, of CVF or any representative. So thanks a lot 
for, I mean, to the governments of Bangladesh and Philippines for, for having uh, invited us today to participate in this, um, in this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your intervention. And these are duly noted as well as your contact information. The Secretariat will be sharing it to the members for their reference as well. So at this juncture, uh, I repeat, so we are now about to endorse the CVF Asia communique to be adopted. And can we again check with the Secretariat if there are comments to the communique? We don't have any new information, so we can go further with the adoption of the communique. Okay, so hearing as there are no comments, I hereby declare the CBF Asia communique adopted. So we have to congratulate all of us for the amazing work that our delegations have done during these past hard working days. So thank you everyone for your support and your kind attention. And we hope to see you in Glasgow. And before we uh, end, can we now give the floor to Special Envoy Azad for his closing remarks? Mr. Azad, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe you are me, dear participants, for adopting uh, this communique. And this is fourth communique we are adopting uh, on the way to Glasgow. I pay my sincere thanks to Philippines for co-hosting this event uh, with Bangladesh. Dear participants, we all know in this globe, all the countries are vulnerable. Who is not vulnerable? It is Europe, North America, obviously island countries, Asia and Pacific countries. But for us, the vulnerable countries, climate change is a question of life and death. Developed country, they are also vulnerable, but they have resources so that they can cope up very quickly, which we can't. COP26 delayed by a year due to COVID, but climate disasters, climate degradation did not stop. So from this COP, we need to achieve double. CVF countries, for the first time, we have with our regional dialogues. You heard from the beginning of today's event. First one was with the uh, Caribbean, Latin America, and then second one with Africa and uh, MENA countries. Third one with the Pacific and the last one with Asia. Our plan is we discussed with all these 48 countries. And it is a matter of, again, uh, proud of all of us that so many new observer countries, uh, at least 13, I believe it would be 15 vulnerable countries, uh, they are going to be newly member with the CVF. In COP26, we will finalize this. So all these countries, we have shared the communique. We prepared the draft. Uh, all through, it is with this uh, Asia regional meeting today, which you finalized today. And work plan is, after discussing in this four regional dialogue, we will have our final wrap up the coming month, middle, that is from 11 to 13. Maybe on 13, we will be finalized analyzing our communicate, incorporating all these four communicate so that we can very smart and uh, take the uh, issues to COP26. As Mr. Nasheed was telling, yes, only the, the CVF is uh, planning and working very robustly with a very calculative way involving all the countries. So, what is our goal? Raise our voice high. This is the time to deliver. 
you saw in the video prime minister sheikh hasina told uh, it is now it is today to deliver we heard about 1.5 degree about net zero uh, 500 billion in 5 uh, years innovative financing monitoring the uh, contribution or participation by the developed countries it could be done by the imf so all these we discussed and these uh, will be incorporated in our communique final version in bangladesh in 2019 we had our planetary emergency uh, this was adopted in our parliament and then uh, cvf presidency came up with the program of prosperity which president nasheed is leading from the forefront uh, as a envoy of the prosperity so bangladesh as the president of cbf current president of cbf took the opportunity to have this prosperity plan first so we named it as mujib climate prosperity plan bangabandhu sheikh mujib rahman he put his six point demand before liberation so keeping that in mind we have uh, prepared a six point demand for climate justice we strongly believe our uh, chair of the cbf also expressed a strong view that this climate prosperity plan could act as a template for all the cbf countries they will adopt this according to their needs according to their priorities and uh, in cop 26 we will be discussing again on this climate prosperity plan we will be discussing about the loss and damage which has been discussed here also about the santiago network for loss and damage the outcome of the um, wim i also saw a comment in the chat box by bill hare the climate analyst he told about that uh, 1.5 degree 500 billion all, all these were spoken enough but not delivered now we need to do, raise our voice in such a way so that the oecd countries developed countries they can come up with their robust plan for 1.5 degree specific action plan for contributing 100 billion dollar per year and also committing the net zero i strongly believe your participation made this event successful and it will make more successful your physical presence in middle of the next month on 11 to 13 of october so that we can have our very uh wise document i would tell that will be much more effective for all the cbf countries for raising our voice to the global platform in cop26 looking forward for a better day this uh, globe we borrowed from our children we want to give it back them with much more prosperity thank you very much thank you for your participation and again special thanks to philippines for co-hosting this thank you dear participants thank you your excellency and with that we formally close the meeting and we thank everyone for joining us and giving their inputs this past few days so Uh, Secretariat, is there anything else you want to mention before we leave? Uh, thank you very much. We don't have anything to add. Okay, so thank you again, everyone. Stay safe, and we hope to see you in the COP uh, during the negotiations. So, goodbye. <laughs>